Well, I'm delighted today to be introducing Stephen Ross for two reasons. Firstly, Professor Ross is the first foreign guest, the first American guest, to be hosted by Tel Aviv University's new center for the study of the United States. The center actually began operations just last month after receiving very generous funding from the Fulbright Foundation. In fact, every university campus in Israel submitted proposals in hopes of receiving the Fulbright Grant, a competition which we here in Tel Aviv won. Not the least due to the wide assortment of scholars in the humanities, in the social sciences, in law, in the faculty of the arts here at the university, all dedicated to studying the culture, the politics, and the history of the United States. So we've consequently planned a rich schedule of public lectures and symposia, faculty seminars, school enrichment programs, community outreach initiatives, conferences and panels, social media events, postdoctoral funding, and so on and so on. We're very ambitious, both for this year and for the years to come. But I'm likewise delighted to be introducing Stephen Ross as the Center's inaugural guest because of his eminent position in what has surprisingly become a most relevant, if not even pressing subject, in American life, the struggle against fascism. He recently reminded readers in an op-ed piece published in the Los Angeles Times marking the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht that the United States was not without its own minions of Nazi sympathizers in the 1930s. Well, we're more or less of the same generation, I think, and I certainly remember the anxious memories of my own grandparents and parents, as they recalled mass rallies devoted to denunciations of the Jewish menace taking place not too far from their own homes in the 1930s. I think sometimes that the ultimate victory in the Second World War over fascism might have even instilled something of a false complacency on our parts, as if an open, tolerant society of citizens Enjoying formal political and social rights is modernity's def default, which means that we can let our guard down. It isn't, and so we can't. And without adding any more, oh, yeah, and take the mic, please. <laughs> Well, uh, what happened to my, ah, okay. First, I want to thank you all for coming and giving up part of your evening to hear this. And tonight, I want to tell you a story. And it's a story you've never heard before. It's a story of a time in American history when hate groups moved from the margins to the mainstream of American society, and when government authorities seemed either complacent or complicit. <clears throat> Last year, many of you may have heard about the march in Charlottesville, the white supremacist march, where white supremacists were chanting, ah, not, not. Oh, Philip, sorry. Good. White supremacists were chanting, the Jews will not replace us. But in 1930s Los Angeles, they were calling for death to Jews. And I want to start by just having you look at this map. And this is a map of Nazi and fascist LA. Uh, all you need to know is the red are Nazi and fascist groups, and the blue are Jews. And imagine then what it would have been like to be a Jew in Los Angeles, surrounded by all these hate groups. The top image here, this is the cover of my book, the top image, when you first look at it, you see Nazis, swastikas, and then you see an American flag. This was downtown Los Angeles, for those of you who have ever been there, 15th Street in Figueroa, and it's, it's the German-American Bund celebrating Hitler's birthday. 
And the other thing is imagine walking anywhere downtown at any time in history and seeing Nazi flags just flying from stores unproblematically. The story I want to tell you tonight <clears throat> begins in July 26, 1933, when Nazis in Los Angeles, operating as the Friends of New Germany, held their first open meeting in which they promised that they were going to save America from its two greatest threats, communists and Jews, who many of them were concerned were one and the same. That's an ominous punctuation. <laughs> Nazis and thunder. Well, at the end of their meeting, which was at the Altheidelberg Inn, a reporter asked if uh, five of the, the brown shirts could pose giving the swastika salute, and they did. And this was on the front page of the newspapers in Los Angeles. Now, for many Americans who would see this picture and see these brown shirts, they probably thought of one of two things. Either they were thugs, or they were keystone cops, you know, people to be laughed at, not to be taken seriously. But they were neither, because the most dangerous Nazis looked like ordinary Americans. They did not wear brown shirts, they did not wear swastika armbands, they wore suit and ties. Here you have Captain Robert Pape, a World War I veteran, who had been sent by Adolf Hitler in March 1933, to Los Angeles to organize Nazi groups all along the Pacific Coast. And his two captains, Hans Winterhalder, the man on the left, the blonde, who was the uh, propaganda chief, and Paul Themlitz, the number two Nazi in the city, who also ran the Aryan bookstore, where you could go and get the latest German pamphlets, propaganda, newspapers, books, anything that talked about Hitler, and the Reich. Well, just to go back, this is the hero of my book, Leon Lewis, and I'll come back to him in a minute. But the last paragraph here, and you see the yellow, the very last paragraph had a very innocuous, seemingly innocuous statement saying, in the basement of the Altheidelberg Inn, the Friends of New Germany have compassionately set up cots for any veteran, war veteran, either a German war veteran or American war veteran, who needed a place to stay who was homeless, who needed a bed, who needed food, who needed a place to shower, anything, food, anything you needed, you could get there. And the only thing it says that they were asked is you had to listen to Hans Winterhalder lecture you on the principles of National Socialism. Well, this may have seemed innocent, except Leon Lewis knew better. Leon Lewis knew that the Nazis, in fact, were trying to build an army in America in the same way Hitler had built his brown shirt army in Germany in the 1920s. Let me take a step back for a moment. Who was this man? Leon Lewis was born in Wisconsin in 1889. He went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C and then went to law school at the University of Chicago, where he graduated in 1913. And rather than take up a private law practice, he dedicated himself to the concept of Tikkun Olam. And he was one of the three founding members of the Anti-Defamation League that had been founded by the B'nai B'rith in 1913. He was the founding executive secretary, and his job was to monitor anti-Semitism throughout the United States. Two years into his job in 1915, he was given the added responsibility of being the uh, ADL's contact with the motion picture industry. So he was regularly talking to the movie heads, the studio heads, producers, about potential anti-Semitic images in American film. 1917, the war breaks out, at least for the Americans, and in June 1917, he entered the army Refusing a commission, he went in as a private, but left as a major. And it was his experience in Europe during the war that I would suggest shaped much of his life. Because what he saw that truly frightened him was human beings were willing to murder other human beings just because a commanding officer said, kill that German 
he's your enemy. Kill that American, he's your enemy. And he wondered if human beings could simply murder other human beings because someone said they're your enemy. What if these same soldiers came back to America and joined groups where they were told, murder that Jew, murder that black, murder that Catholic. He had seen what human beings were capable of doing. And when he came back from war, he urged the ADL to set up the three-person operation, uh, to set up an international division to monitor anti-Semitism in Europe. And if any of you have ever been part of organizations and you come up with a really good idea of what that organization should do, guess what happens? You get put in charge. So he now became the founding international secretary of the ADL. And he remained in that until uh, the ADL moved its headquarters from Chicago to Cincinnati. But he had a young family and decided not to move. But he did move to Los Angeles in 1931. And he assumed the position of the ADL's representative to Southern California. And he also continued working as the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry. Well, when he read that line about the basement being set up as simply a welcoming place, he understood why this was dangerous. He understood that Germans were trying, the Nazis, not simply Germans, were trying to build an army of disgruntled American and German war veterans, men who had been used to killing. And <clears throat> he understood that while Germans would be unlikely to follow an American, and Americans would be unlikely to follow a German, if he could sneak both into the Friends of New Germany, he could find out what they were up to. And so as a veteran, he went and he recruited four of his friends from the Disabled American Veteran Group and asked them and their wives, these were husband and wife spy teams, to go undercover and join every Nazi and fascist group in Los Angeles. And his first recruit was one that was meant to truly enamor the local Nazis. It was Captain John Schmidt. John Schmidt had been born in Germany. His father was a famous general in the Bavarian army. His brother was a high-ranking officer in the German army. He had served as a German military cadet until the age of 16 when he came to America, lied about his age, and joined the army here, and fought with General Pershing in Mexico, and then fought in Europe with the expeditionary forces against his own family. He agreed to join and go undercover because he still remained a German, although he was a German-American. They also recruited Captain Carl Sunderland and his wife Blanche, and Sunderland had spent most of his life in the cavalry. They recruited Major C. Bert Allen, and finally, the one Jew in the entire spy operation, Colonel William Conley. And he did not use Conley often, just at the beginning, mainly because no one thought he was Jewish. He didn't look Jewish, didn't have a Jewish last name. But what the Nazis knew was that he was the national commander of the uh, disabled American veterans. And he had been touring the country as the most outspoken critic of the Roosevelt administration and of Congress. Why? Because in March 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt assumed the office of president, the first act that he and Congress passed was the Economy Act of 1933, which cut military benefits from in the range of $80 to $100 a month down to $20, or in many cases, nothing at all. And this is why the Nazis thought they could build an army. Because who did Hitler recruit? Hitler recruited the disgruntled World War I veterans who felt they had gone off to war as patriots in the same way their American counterparts have. And what we have seen in every war is men and now women are sent off to war with great patriotic applause. And when they come home, they're thrown on the ash heaps of history. Well, the Nazis believed that L.A. was the fertile ground the best probably ground in the United States. Why? Because you had more military veterans. You had over 300,000 war veterans living in Southern California. 
you're at 150,000 living in LA County and also LA, the city of LA, German Americans were the largest ethnic group in the city with 150,000. And so Leon Lewis knew that there was a real danger that they could in fact recruit these veterans who were angry at Roosevelt, angry at Congress for cutting them off with virtually no money. These men went undercover and within a few weeks they met a man, by the way, Leon Lewis was doing this as an attorney, as a lawyer. He didn't think he was going to be a spy master, but since no one seemed to be acting, he thought, I'll get evidence, I'll get legal evidence that can stand up in court, and then I will turn it over to the authorities, and they know how to run these kind of operations, I don't, and they will pursue the Nazis. <clears throat> well, his four spies, and really the first three, went undercover, they joined the Friends of New Germany, they were greeted with great respect because they had all been officers and that was also one of the reasons Leon Lewis recruited them they had all been in combat, they had all been under fire and Lewis wanted men who wouldn't buckle under pressure, who wouldn't fold if they were interrogated and within a few weeks they met a man, Dietrich Gefkin Dietrich Gefkin had told them about how he had been one of Hitler's first recruits in Munich he had been since the early 20s. He had left Germany after he threw acid in the face of a Jew and then shot two communists to death, probably Jews as well, fled to America, wound up living in San Francisco, and he joined the National Guard in San Francisco. And during his time in the National Guard, he drew up a blueprint of the San Francisco Armory. And the blueprint contained the location of all the ammunition, all the weapons, the officers' quarters, and the enlisted men's quarters. And he turned to the, three, the first three spies I mentioned, and he told them he needed them to get him the blueprints for the Los Angeles armory, and he needed machine guns. And they said, well, why do you need this? And he told them the following story. He said, on the appointed day, we are going to have groups of Nazis all along the West Coast, silver shirts who were the American fascists on uh, January 30th, right after Hitler was, became Reich Chancellor of Germany, a former screenwriter, William Dudley Pelly, announced if a painter can become the Reich Chancellor of Germany, we can start the silver shirts in America. Germany has its brown shirts, Italy has its black shirts, and now America will have its silver shirts. And the silver shirts were anti-Semitic, by and large, anti-communist. And he said, I have been working with silver shirts in San Diego, who have been working, training with the Nazis out in the desert area, and they were buying weapons from two corrupt Marines in the San Diego naval base, who were selling them heavy ammunition. And they were preparing for the day in which they would have groups of, again, the Nazis, the local Nazis, the silver shirts, and they would be joined by stormtroopers. Every German vessel that docked along American coast, but particularly along the Pacific coast, had a contingent of stormtroopers on it. They would descend on the three armories at the same day, at the same moment, the same time, and they would come heavily armed, and they would, excuse me, they would corral all the men and they would offer them a choice. Do you want to join us in saving America from communism and Judaism? Those who agreed would be welcomed into their army, and those who said no would be murdered on the spot. Well, Leon Lewis was smart. This was just hearsay. And so for one of the meetings, he actually planted a dictaphone, a microphone, in a hotel room where they were having a meeting, and he recorded the entire conversation. He thought, now I have the evidence I need to get the local authorities. This is, by the way, the Aryan bookstore I mentioned. The man on the left in the light-colored suit was Hermann Schwinn, who would become the uh, head of the Friends of New Germany. He would then become the head of the German-American Bund in LA, and he would be the number two Nazi in all of America. First person Leon Lewis went to talk to was the chief of police, uh, James Tugun Davis. 
and I'm showing you his favorite portrait. This is the one he always wanted the newspapers to print. Why? Because he was very vain. Uh, and he won the police pistol shooting contest, the national police, several years in a row with both his left hand and his right hand. And I have actually other pictures that I didn't bring that have one of his policemen standing with a cigarette in his mouth while Captain James Two-Gun Davis is shooting the cigarette out of his mouth. I think I would have retired from the police force before that. But he goes to talk to Captain Davis, Chief Davis, I should say, and several minutes, well, actually, Leon Lewis wrote a memo afterwards, and I've mentioned previous talks. I, all these spy reports, by the way, Leon Lewis asked his spies to call his office every day and update him. He said, send nothing in the mail, because mail can be intercepted. And either he or the secretary took the uh, call. Both of them knew shorthand. And so they took down the, you know, the notes in shorthand, and then they were typed up. And fortunately for me, there are two, three hundred boxes at Cal State Northridge, which is about 40 minutes north of Los Angeles. Those files are still there, and that's where most of my book came from. And when I opened up the box that contained this memo, I could feel over 80 years later the heat coming up. Because Leon Lewis wrote, as soon as he got back to his office, he said, I was two minutes into my talk explaining who we were and what we had discovered. And Chief Davis stopped me and said, you don't get it. You don't get it. Hitler's only doing what he needs to do to save Germany from the Jews. And that the real threat to Los Angeles are not Nazis and fascists. It's all those communists in Boyle Heights. And Boyle Heights was the Jewish neighborhood of Los Angeles. And Lewis knew that as far as Chief Davis was concerned, Every communist was a Jew, and every Jew was a communist. So he then went to Sheriff Eugene Biscalus. There's only one problem. The photograph here is engraved to the Honorable Dr. George Gisling. George Gisling was the Nazi counsel to Los Angeles, and I have pictures that I got from Gisling's daughter of the two socializing together. They were good friends. He threw him out of his office. Lewis finally went to the FBI, and he said they were sympathetic, but they said there's nothing we can do unless ordered by Washington and J. Edgar Hoover. The problem in 1933, when this is occurring, the FBI had only 300 agents, most of them on the East Coast, and those who were in the uh, L.A. office were not going to monitor fascists and Nazis. Hoover only wanted them to monitor Hollywood Jews and lefties, who he felt were a far greater threat to America. Well, at that point, Leon Lewis knew something had to be done. And who was going to do it? Since no one else was going to do it, he felt it was incumbent upon him to keep the spy operation going. The only problem is he soon ran out of money. He was funding this. He was paying his agents a very modest stipend and their expenses. He had a family with two small children. And by November, January, uh, December, he had lost virtually all his clients, complaining, Leon, we love you, but you're paying no attention at all to our business. And he wasn't. And he knew, and he wrote a memo saying, either I need to get funding or I have to shut down the spy operation. And so, in a desperate last effort, he went to three men he had known for years, working as the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry. The first was Irving Thalberg, who was the number two person at MGM, and was also the single greatest fundraiser in the entire city of Los Angeles for Jewish causes. He also then went to Rabbi Edgar Magnin, who was the rabbi of Wilshire Boulevard Temple, which is the largest synagogue in Los Angeles, and still is the largest synagogue, it was also known as the Synagogue to the Stars because it was the synagogue that virtually all the Jewish moguls belonged to, Jewish movie stars belonged to, uh, and prominent Jewish individuals within the city, including the man standing next to him, Mendel Silberberg, who was the most powerful entertainment attorney in the United States. In fact, he was really the first great entertainment attorney. He represented all the studios. He represented most of the... Uh, studio heads personally. He represented most of the very wealthy 
Jewish movie stars, and he also represented the Motion Picture Producers Association. And on top of all of that, he was considered one of the five Republican kingmakers, meaning he was one of the five guys who went in that proverbial smoke-filled room at the GOP conventions to decide who was going to be the next Republican nominee for president. And I managed to interview a few people who had known, who were very young at the time, who knew Mendel Soberberg. And they, he said, he's one of these quiet men who simply told you what to do. And when Mendel spoke, you did anything, he said. Well, the three of them heard what Leon Lewis had to say, and Mendel Silberberg said, don't worry about it. I'll get you the money you need. And he phoned the 40 most powerful men, no women, the most powerful men in Hollywood, and told them to show up at the uh, Hillcrest Country Club on the night of March 13th, 1934. He did not tell them what it was going on, because again, you didn't ask Mendel why, you just showed up. And that night, it was a red carpet event without the red carpet. Hillcrest, by the way, had been founded in 1920 because Jews had been systematically thrown out of every country club in the city. They wanted a place where they could play golf, swim, play tennis. And of course, the great irony is they bought this piece of property that was fairly isolated. And when they started digging to make their golf course, they hit oil and became probably the wealthiest country club in the United States. So much for the Goyim. Uh, on that evening, they show up and they, the 40 men are taken into a private dining room. And in front of every one of their seats are copies of the Silver Ranger magazine, which was the periodical put out by the Silver Shirts. And as they leaf through, they saw article after article denouncing the Hollywood Jews. In fact, the most vituperative pieces were all anti-Hollywood, anti-Jew. And here you have, uh, it says boycott. This was an image uh, that was popular in these magazines. But the silver shirts took these, turned them into stickers. The gods are listening. <laughs> turned them into stickers and put them up on buildings and telephone poles throughout Los Angeles. Again, imagine walking through whatever city you are, and these are the images in public, thousands of them. Boycott the movies, Hollywood is the Sodom and Gomorrah, where international jewelry uh, controls vice, doping, gambling, and where young Gentile girls are basically raped by Jewish producers, directors, and casting directors. They also had images like this that was also put up on stickers throughout the city. Those images got the attention of the 40 men in the room. We're talking about Louis B. Mayer, Jack Warner, Samuel Goldwyn, Harry, Co Harry Cohn. We're talking about the very elite of Hollywood. And then Leon Lewis surprised them by saying, my agents have discovered you don't pay any attention to your below-the-line personnel, the employees who are 70 to 80 percent of the studios, you're only paying attention to the above the line. That is, above the line meaning the names that come on at the beginning of a movie, your actors, your directors, your producers, your writers. And at the very end of the movie, that's your below the line, the craft workers, the grips, the electricians. He said, your foremen are Aryanizing your studios. And he turned to Louis B. Mary, he said, Louis, MGM is virtually 100% Aryan. They are firing every Jewish blue-collar worker. Harry Cohn, Columbia, same. Paramount, 100% Aryan, 100%. And he said, worse yet, my spies have uncovered hit lists, and your names are on those hit lists. The end of the evening, Leon Lewis walked out with the equivalent in 2018 dollars of $424,000 a year, and it pledged that they would continue giving that money every year until they no longer needed to run a spy operation. And it's a good thing they did because Leon Lewis continued that operation from 1933 until the end of World War II. Even after Pearl Harbor, he knew anti-Semitism was rife and that local authorities were not going to protect Jews, so it was up to him to do so. And it's a good thing he continued it because during those years, 
His spies foiled the plot to drive through Boyle Heights, the Jewish neighborhood, with machine guns, machine gunning to his death as many Jews as they could. They foiled the plot uh, that um, Nazis were going to create a phony fumigation company and pump cyanide into the home of Jews. And he also uncovered several plots to blow up military installations all along the Pacific coast and to sabotage aircraft factories in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles was the largest producer of aircraft in the United States. But tonight, I want to tell you about two of the most shocking plots I came across. Leon Lewis had his agents testify, those first four men, well, Conley didn't testify because he didn't want a Jew on the stand. But the first three spies testified twice openly, once at a court trial and then again at the first House on american Activities Committee hearings in Los Angeles in August 1934. And Leon Lewis knew if he had his spies testify, they were burned and they couldn't use them anymore. But he thought when Americans heard about what was going on, heard his spies testify about going down to the docks with Hermann Schwinn and seeing Schwinn, since Schmidt spoke German, he's standing there when the captain would give Schwinn secret orders from Berlin, give him money from Berlin. They saw propaganda, which was illegal to bring into this country, coming through the ports of Los Angeles because for Nazis, LA, not New York, was the most important city in America because New York was closely, the ports of New York were closely guarded because the mayor of New York, Fiorella LaGuardia, was, his father was Italian, but his mother was Jewish. So, and particularly in this country, depending on what side of the divide you're on, he was a Jew and felt very close, and he was probably one of the most anti-Nazi politicians in America. Whereas in L.A., they were able to get into the ports and do whatever they wanted. And in fact, later on, this is where Gestapo spies came, was through Los Angeles. So he recruited this man, Chuck Slocum, who had not been a military veteran, but had been born in Oakland, raised in Long Beach. And in the early 1930s, he had joined the Ku Klux Klan because he was an ardent anti-communist. But after attending Klan meetings for a while, he realized the Klan was not just anti-communist. They hated Jews. They hated Catholics. They hated blacks and wanted to do physical damage to all of them. And Slocum said, I don't hate any of them. I hate communists, but it's, I don't think every communist is a Jew and every Jew is a communist. And he wound up working for Leon Lewis. And again, one thing Leon Lewis asked his men to do is to rise to positions of prominence. And Slocum soon became the Ku Klux Klan's point person with every Nazi and fascist group in the city. And again, a good thing he did because he became the right-hand man to Ingram Hughes. Ingram Hughes was a lawyer who never practiced, but he had worked for a number of years at the Los Angeles Times as a linotype operator. And in September 1935, he had printed up this proclamation and he went into the Times office at two or three in the morning on a Sunday morning and he and his friends who were still working there inserted this proclamation into every copy of the Los Angeles Times. And imagine it's Sunday morning, you pick up the Times from your front door and out pops this proclamation. The one phrase you need to know, it's a long diatribe against Jews, but the critical phrase and the one that sent chills up my back is in here he writes, I call upon all true Christians to join me in enacting the final solution to the Jewish problem that cannot be obtained through legislative methods. What was that final solution? Well, he told Chuck Slocum his plan was he would work with silver shirts and Nazis. They would, uh, and the very, and other assorted fascist groups, because he founded his own fascist group, the American Nationalist Party, and on a specific evening, they would kidnap 20 major Jewish figures in Los Angeles. Movie people, bankers, lawyers, judges, people like Busby Berkeley, who I didn't know was Jewish until I came across his name on the hit list. And the idea was they would kidnap these men, they were going to bring them to a deserted park, they were going to hang them, 
And while they were dangling from the ropes, dying, they would all bring machine guns with them, and they would shoot the bodies with so much lead that they would sever the trunk from the top of the body. They then planned to call the newspapers in the early in the morning, get them out there, and the newspapers, of course, would report on this. These reports would go viral before social media. They still believed they would go viral. And what Ingram Hughes told Slocum is he said, when good Christians read what we were able to do to kill 20 of the biggest Jews in L.A., it will start pogroms throughout the United States. Well, Leon Lewis was concerned. He didn't want, you know, one of the things people ask me is how do we know these things would happen? And my response is, can you really take a chance? It just takes one crazy person, as we just saw the other week in Pittsburgh, as we saw in Orlando, as we saw in San Bernardino. Just one person filled with hate who can get a gun and murder. And so he had Slocum argue with uh, Ingram Hughes because they all knew the Nazis and fascists knew Leon Lewis was running a spy ring. They just didn't know who his spies were. They knew it because the uh, chief of police had appointed William Red Hines, Captain William Red Hines, to run the Red Squad. And Hines was frequently seen dining with the Nazis, trading information. They would give him information about communists, and the, uh, he would give them information about anything that threatened them. And he told them, about Leon Lewis. He just didn't know who, who his spies were. And Lewis was known in Nazi circles as the most dangerous Jew in Los Angeles. And so Slocum convinced Ingram Hughes. He said, look, if we go ahead with this, we know there's a spy. In one of these groups, there is a Leon Lewis spy. And if we go ahead and do this, the spy's going to turn us in and we will spend the rest of our lives either in jail or being executed. And he said, let's postpone this. We won't stop, but we will postpone this until we discover who the spy is. And of course, they never did discover who the spy was. But even more frightening was a plot that happened two years later in the fall of 1937. And this plot was led by Captain Leopold McLaughlin, who you see scrunched down in the light-colored suit all the way to the left. And he is scrunched down because he's somewhere between 6'6 six, six and 6'8. Six, and Leopold McLaughlin was one of the, I can't remember now, it's either six or seven McLaughlin brothers, the most famous being Victor McLaughlin, who won an Oscar in 1935 for his role in the film, ironically, The Informer. Well, McLaughlin hated Jews. And he got together with Chuck Slocum, with Ken Alexander, who was in charge of all the silver shirts for Southern California, and with the fascist Henry Allen, who I'll talk about in a moment, and told them about his plans. And his plan was that they would, in fact, work with a contingent, because he had already scoped things out. Now, just let me go back one second. Who was this guy? He was a murderer. He used war as an excuse to murder, but he had fought in the Boer War. He had fought in the British Army in World War I. He had published four books on how to kill in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And on top of all of that, he was the world's jiu-jitsu champion. And he had taught jiu-jitsu to Scotland Yard. He had taught jiu-jitsu to the French Sûreté. And he was now in Los Angeles teaching jiu-jitsu to the Nazis, the silver shirts, the white Russians, the people who brought you the pogroms in the Ukraine and Russia. So this is a man who was used to killing and was teaching people how to kill. And his plan was they were going to target the 24 or 24 of the leading Hollywood Jews. And they would have teams of four men go to their homes, they had obtained, he had obtained dynamite, and he had teams of four men go to these homes, or the plan was to go to the homes, and on a coordinated moment, all 24 homes would be blown up. And these included Jack Warner, Samuel Goldwyn, 
Louis B. Mayer, and two movie stars who were Christian but were known to be very friendly, too friendly to the Jews. Charlie Chaplin, who was then not only the major, most prominent movie star, he was the most famous man, or should I say the most famous person in the world, and also James Cagney, a good Irish movie star who spoke fluent Yiddish. He wanted to send a message. And like Ingram Hughes, he promised his compatriots that if they did this, it would start bloodbaths throughout the United States, even more than Ingram Hughes. If you blow up 24 of the most powerful Hollywood Jews, it sends a message that any Jew can be reached and murdered. Henry Allen was ready to murder. He was longing to murder. In fact, he had written the House Un-American Activities Committee saying he would love to be able to kill Jews on behalf of America. And one day when he was driving with Chuck Slocum, he pulled his car to the side of the road and showed him there, if you can see in the corner, there's a leather pouch and there's a plastic handle. And that was known as the kike killer. And he pulled the car and said, let me show you how to use a kike killer. And he pulled it out and he said, you take, when you see a Jew, you shove it in his stomach and when he bends over, you take the handle as hard as you can and you just keep hitting him on the head until you hear his skull crack. Well, this was a plot that was getting too close. And so Leon Lewis had Slocum convince his two compatriots, Ken Alexander and Henry Allen, that in fact McLaughlin was going to go through with the murders and then turn state's evidence, that he was going to go to the DA and in exchange for immunity, he would tell them who the other three plotters were. And so Leon Lewis went ahead and called the DA. And the DA was forewarned when Slocum convinced the other two men that they better go in and testify and get immunity against McLaughlin. And that's what they did. The, they didn't know that the DA was waiting for them, but the DA took their sworn affidavits, after which McLaughlin was arrested. By the way, I just threw this in just to show you. My um, editor wanted to put this on the cover of my book, and I said no, because if I see this, I think Nazi Germany. This is Hindenburg Park, owned and run by the Nazis, 17 miles northeast of LA. And starting in 1938, every summer they ran a Nazi summer camp for good Nazi fascist boys and girls. That's Deutsche Haus with Hermann Schwinn, who was one of the co-plotters in uh, McLaughlin's plot to murder the Jews. Well, McLaughlin was arrested, but he was not charged with murder. He was only charged, uh, attempted murder, he was only charged with extortion because, in fact, in addition to all the people that he was teaching jiu-jitsu to, he was teaching it to a millionaire in Santa Barbara, a very naive man, who wanted nothing more than to become a naval intelligence officer. And McLaughlin said, in exchange for $25,000, I can get you secret spy information. You can turn it over to the Navy, and they're going to make you an officer. And, of course, he was lying. And at that point, uh, Chancellor pressed charges. Leon Lewis decided to play the long game. He was not going to have him charged with attempted murder for the following reason. Only one person ever listened to him, and that was the head of the Office of Naval Intelligence along the Pacific Coast, Commander Ellis Zacharias, a Jew. The Army didn't listen, the FBI didn't listen, police didn't listen, the sheriff didn't listen. But he discovered but that part of the plotters were members of the police department and the sheriff's department, and that the Navy had been in fact hoodwinked early on by Chancellor and by McLaughlin. And so he didn't want to embarrass any of them, but he understood that if he didn't say anything, they all owed him a favor, and that the next time he would go to them talking about a plot, they would believe him. McLaughlin was found guilty. He was sentenced to five years in prison, uh, but the sentence was suspended if he took the next boat out of L.A. and never appeared on American soil. His brother Victor was sitting in the back row of the courtroom, 
and Victor apparently went out immediately and bought a one-way ticket to Liverpool, and several days later, McLaughlin was gone, never to be seen again. The last story I want to tell you tonight is perhaps the most amazing of all, and it's a story about resistance to Nazism coming from truly the most unexpected source you could possibly imagine, and that is the German General Counsel to the Los Angeles George Gisling. George Gisling, for those of you who know Hollywood history of the 30s and 40s, is probably the most reviled villain of all. Why? Because in May 1933, Adolf Hitler and the Minister of uh, Enlightenment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, decided, both of whom were major movie fans, and they had believed that part of the reason Germany lost World War I was because of the effective propaganda of both the British and the American movie industries. And he was determined to keep America neutral for as long as possible so that he could build up his army, start a war in Europe, and keep the Americans out of it. And he understood if Americans were making anti-Nazi movies from the start, they could sway public opinion. And so he sent George Gisling over to Los Angeles, armed with one of the most powerful weapons possible, the German import law of 1931 that had section 15 that said any studio that makes a movie that in any way defames the German character, people, or nation will have all its films banned. And if enough of those films come out of any one nation, the entire nation's product will be banned. Well, Hollywood made 30% of its profits from the European market, and Germany was the second largest market in Europe. And what many people don't realize is that Hollywood is a business. In fact, Hollywood is in the money-making business, not the consciousness-raising business. And for many of the studio heads, if they could make money and raise consciousness, that was great. But in this case, had they not listened to Gisling, their movies would have been all banned, and most of them would have been fired for losing all that income. Well, Gisling then immediately required them to send him copies of every movie that featured a German or a German theme. He watched those movies in screening rooms, and he told them what to cut, and they cut them. A year later, his task was made much easier when Hollywood, which was under attack, from American citizens for making movies that were too filled with sex and violence and crime. They passed the production code and that had section 10 that said no studio that wants a production code seal of approval can make a movie that in any way defames, mocks, or denigrates a foreign leader or foreign nation. You needed a production code seal to get your movie into a first-run movie theater and it's the first one movie theaters where studios made 70 to 80 percent of their profits. So the moguls, even though they hated Gisling, they held their nose and they listened to his cuts. Well, I wanted to know what did Los Angeles society, Christian society, the elite society, think of this man? And so I started reading the social column in the LA Times, which was the newspaper of record in LA, from May 1933 when he arrived until 1941, June 1941, when Franklin Roosevelt expelled all German uh, diplomats from the United States. And what I discovered surprised me. He was considered the most popular, beloved of all the diplomats in Los Angeles. He was the one intellectual amongst the crowd. He spoke five languages. He was considered one of the four best bridge players in the city. He was considered one of the best dancers of anybody in the diplomatic corps. Uh, he had also told everyone he had gone to gymnasium in Switzerland, in Davos, where he had studied. He went to a special gymnasium that uh, specialized in uh, Sanskrit and ancient languages and literature. And afterwards, he actually went to law school, got a JD, and in those days a JD wasn't just three years, you had to write a dissertation, and he wrote a long dissertation. I thought, I'm sorry, a man who is this sophisticated can't be a Nazi. I just, something in my gut said, he can't be 
who he seems to be. And so, many of you may know the website Ancestry.com, where you can look up families. Well, they have a sibling website called Fold3.com, which is military records. And I had known from what I had read about Gisling that he had been arrested after the war and was in Nuremberg. And so I looked through the records until I finally found a letter from this man, Julius S. Klein, written in 1947. He was then Brigadier General Julius S. Klein, the highest ranking Jew in the American army. And the letter started off by saying, this is the first and only testimonial I will ever write for a Nazi because George Gisling is no Nazi. George Gisling is a German nationalist who has worked consistently for the restoration of democracy in Germany and since 1933 he has been secretly passing me information about the German economy, about the German-American Bund, and after going to a meeting, a special secret meeting in Washington in January 1940, he passed me information about German war plans. Please release him. Gisling was released several days later. But there's even more to the story because it turns out that Julius Klein and his nephew, Joe Roos, in fact launched the first undercover operation spying on Nazis in America. Uh, Joe Roos was Viennese born, Berlin raised. Uh, Julius Klein was Chicago born, but Berlin raised. And when both men returned to Chicago in the early 1930s, they were both newspaper men. In addition to running uh, a German-American newspaper that Klein did, and Joe Roos worked for the um, Hearst publications, they were spying on Germans returning from Germany and getting information about the rise of National Socialism and what Hitler's plans were. And when Joe Roos's editor found out that he and his uncle were running this spy operation, he said, I want you to type up a memo uh, give it to me, and then I want you to meet with our publisher, Roy Keane. Well, in addition to being the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, he was also the commander of the Illinois State Guard. And after listening to Joe Roos describe the spy operation, he gave him a piece of paper and said, I want you to report to the following hotel, in the following room, on the following day, at the following time, and you're going to meet an army colonel, and I want you to do anything he says Forget about your newspaper work for the time being. You're still on payroll, but you do what he tells you to do. And so Roos shows up and he tells the colonel everything he's doing. And the colonel says, you and your uncle are incredibly brave and incredibly foolish. You have no idea what you're doing. You're going to be caught and they will kill you. He said, I want you to spend the next few weeks I'm assigning you to my counter espionage team. They're going to teach you everything you need to know about running a spy operation, how to go in and out of buildings, how to pass notes, how to not be detected when you're following them, anything. And Roos did this and learned the technique of counterespionage, and he went to L.A. in 1934, became um, Leon Lewis's first and only volunteer, and ran the spy, he was doing the logistics of the spy operation on a part-time basis, and after Kristallnacht, he quit his job as a story editor at one of the studios to work full-time with Leon Lewis running the spy ring. Well, it may surprise you to know who was that army colonel. It was General George C. Marshall. And for the rest of the war from the 30s on, both Lewis and Roos were sending George Marshall reports on what Nazis were doing in Los Angeles. Well, Gisling leaves in July 1941. He goes back to Germany. And the last story I want to tell you now is what happens right after Pearl Harbor. The Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941. Within hours, the morning of December 8th, the FBI sends a teletype to every city, but in LA you can actually go online to the FBI and you can find a day-by-day, hour-by-hour list of who is arrested when they're arrested. And when you look at that list, it is incredibly impressive. Within 48 hours, 
the FBI rounds up virtually every major Nazi, uh, Italian fascist, and Japanese fascist and puts them in detention or puts them in jail. Well, I wanted to know how is that possible? How did they do that? Because Leon Lewis had been begging the FBI for years to put Hermann Schwinn under surveillance. And in 1940, the uh, special agent in charge of the Los Angeles Bureau writes J. Edgar Hoover and says, we want permission to put a full-time agent on Hermann Schwinn, putting him under surveillance. And again, remember, Hermann Schwinn was then the second most powerful Nazi in the United States. People expected that he would become the head of the National German American Bund. Hoover writes back to the local agent saying, Hermann Schwinn has broken no law Therefore, you cannot put him under surveillance. But of course, the hypocrisy is all these Hollywood figures had broken no law, but he had ordered the local bureau to put movie stars, directors, and producers under surveillance simply because they were alleged communists. So if this is the case, oh, Hoover did finally agree to have his agents put Schwinn under surveillance around November 15th, 1941 three weeks before Pearl Harbor. And then he said, send your agent to Washington, we will train him, and then he will come back to Los Angeles to put Schwinn under surveillance. When I got Herman Schwinn's Freedom of Information Act file, the first entry started in 1942. Well, if the FBI had no records on him until 1942, how did they know who to arrest? And the answer is, starting in September 1939, the moment that Germany invaded Poland, Joe Roos and Leon Lewis started compiling lists from their spy reports of every major Nazi and fascist in Los Angeles. In some cases, it would be a name and address. In most cases, it would be a name, address, one or two sentences. And for the major people, it would be a paragraph or an entire page describing what they were doing. They also divided their list, which they updated every six months or so, and sent that list to the FBI, to naval intelligence, and to army intelligence. And they divided the lists into three categories. They called them highly dangerous, dangerous, and suspicious. Well, when I saw the uh, FBI teletype come in, the records, they had divided their list into what they called A, B, and C and said to their local bureau, A are the most dangerous, B are dangerous, and C are people we want to round up and interrogate. Start with your A and arrest them. And so I thought, oh God, I know where this comes from, but to make sure, because I'm a historian and I need my evidence, not just your gut, I went to the National Archives and I found the FBI memo and I found the entire list and all they had done was type up Leon Lewis and Joe Roos's list, claim it as their own, and take all the credit. Now, Leon Lewis and Joe Roos didn't care. They didn't care the FBI took all the credit because they got all the bad guys arrested. And in fact, they seized all the records at Deutsch House. I also went through the records they seized that are in the National Archives as well. So, I want to end by asking, what's the take home from all of this? What's the message? How does it speak to us? Well, Leon Lewis understood that democracy is a fragile thing. That in fact, democracy requires constant vigilance from hate groups and haters who are trying to chip away at democratic rights and at human rights. And without ever picking up a gun, without ever using a weapon, he, is in, he and his undercover operatives defeated a whole range of enemies bent on destruction and murder. And remember, with the exception of one man, their undercover operatives, operatives were all Christians. And yet, they never felt they were fighting on behalf of Jews. They felt they were fighting on behalf of Americans. And the message they had is when hate groups come into our country and preach death against Jews, blacks,
Catholics and communists. It is up to every American citizen, no matter what you may feel in your head, it is up to every one of us to protect every other American, regardless of their race, their religion, or their ethnicity. And I want to end by quoting Leon Lewis in a memo he wrote right after the end of World War II, reflecting on his experience. And he wrote, only in a truly tolerant America can we achieve the, rec can we achieve the true democratic ideal in our country. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Don't be shy. Someone has to ask the first question. Yes. Right at the very beginning, you mentioned Pate, and you said he'd been sent by the Nazis. I mentioned, oh, Pate, Pate. yeah. Uh, and you said he'd been sent by the Nazis. Could you say a little bit about how the connection between Pape and the Nazis began? He was a World War I veteran. He was a captain in the army. And I, I believe he had crossed paths with either Hitler or Fritz Wiedemann, who had been Hitler's uh, commanding officer. And he was, I'm going to guess it's Wiedemann. And he was um, advised that this would be a good man. He was organized, he was conscientious, and he was a national socialist. And so he sent him to Los Angeles. Um, but he eventually left because the others Schwinn, Winterhalder, and Themlitz felt that he wasn't sufficiently anti-Semitic. And uh, according to one of the f spies, one day they confronted Pape and they beat him up. They were so angry, they beat him, and Pape then left and went back to Germany, and Hermann Schwinn took his place. Yes? I have two maybe related questions. When one looks at this map, it would seem that there's this very strong network cohesive network of groups because it's, it's we're, we're seeing sort of a social historical map here. Were these groups in fact um, discernible to the public? Were they operating in a more furtive manner? And the second question, which might be related, is does, does your research, whether it's more on the book that you wrote or, or didn't get into the book, um, look at the broader Jewish community and their responses beyond the idiot? and the specific Hollywood um, figures whom you alluded to? Yes. Uh, the first one, yes, the public knew about these groups. They were very open. All these groups were totally open. They weren't open about their plots, but they were open in their anti-Semitism, they were open in their denunciation of Jews, and they were open in their calls for death to communists. Less, less open about calling for death to Jews, but the public knew it. The public knew. Again, for Christian society then, for many people, they shared the views of the police chief and the sheriff that every Jew was a commie and every commie was a Jew. Um, the second point was, remind me again now? The broader Jewish community beyond the age. Yes. Well, this was, yes. You know, there's a lot written. Uh, I've spent 40 years at USC as a historian, and this is the first time I've gone into, in many ways, my own history. My own, my family were uh, survivors. Um, and what I can tell you is that this idea that Jews were complacent, that why didn't Jews do more to stop Hitler is totally wrong. Jews, in fact, did do a lot. The problem is, and it gets to your question, they had a deeply divided strategy of how to respond to this crazy man. And uh, Leon Lewis was waiting patiently for someone to do something. And what he saw is a deep division between the two leading Jewish groups, both in the United States and in Los Angeles, the American Jewish Congress that was led by Rabbi Stephen Wise. And they wanted to pursue a very aggressive strategy of getting in Hitler's face. They said, Hitler is a bully. And the only way you can deal with bullies is to get right in their face and threaten them. And he was part of the group, the American Jewish Congress, uh, aligned with Samuel Untermeyer, who started an international boycott of all German products until Germany stopped persecuting not just Jews, but all minorities. 
The other side of the stream was the American Jewish Committee led by Judge Proskauer, who had been the founder of Proskauer Rose, one of the most prominent Jewish law firms in the United States. He argued that if you get in Hitler's face and take an aggressive strategy, Hitler will double down on the Jews and he will make it even worse for the Jews in Germany. And therefore what we need to do is be smarter than him and work with religious leaders throughout Germany and get them to persuade Hitler to stop doing this or to ease the pressure on the Jews. The problem is, come, you know, Lewis is writing about this, and I have memos where he's totally frustrated. He says there's a lot of talk, but no action. And when the Nazis hold their first meeting and no one is reacting to it, that was the moment, literally a few days afterwards, that he recruited the spies. And on just one note, on this issue of why didn't Jews do more, I want to turn it on its head and say, why didn't government authorities do more to stop the spread of Nazism and fascism across America? And they did almost nothing. Yes. Yes, I do know what happened because I tracked down his daughter and I interviewed the daughter. His daughter was born in New York and was 13. He was a vice counsel in New York and was 13 when they left the country. And I interviewed her three times, once on telephone, once through email, and then I went up to her home in Northern California. And unfortunately, a year after I interviewed her, she passed her. She was dying of cancer when I saw her. And the first thing she said to me when I entered the room or her home, she said, thank God you're here. Somebody's going to finally get my father's story straight. And I have to tell you, I felt for her to know what your father did. And, and everyone's writing about it like he's the worst villain ever to come from Germany to America. She told me when they got back to Berlin. Now, I should mention one thing. I found both in the records of the spy reports, they talked about how uh, George Gissling was hated by most of the Bund. Because George Gissling, they argued, was not sufficiently national socialist, and George Gissling was not making enough anti-Semitic statements. In fact, George Gissling was making no anti-Semitic statements. I also had, through my colleague, a German historian, Wolf Gruner, I hired one of his former PhD students to go into the German Foreign Office files and get Gissling's record. And sure enough, there were letters from the L.A. Bund asking, demanding that he be fired and replaced with a true national socialist. Well, I can tell you as far as, I don't know how much, well, no, Hitler would have been paying attention along with Goebbels. They didn't care about that, at least not at that moment. They cared about, Gissling did, a great job of stopping Hollywood from making these anti-Nazi movies, in part because the production code helped him do that. But when he came back to Germany, he was immediately uh, taken to Gestapo headquarters in Berlin. And before he went in, he was taken there for three days, three nights. He told his daughter, at least she told me, she said, my father said, be a dumb 13-year-old. When they ask you questions, if they come and ask you questions, you don't know anything. You're just a 13-year-old girl who knows nothing. She was very shrewd even as a 13-year-old. So Gisling is eventually released. He's a very smooth talker. In 19, and he manages to stay in the diplomat, in the foreign service. But in 1944, when there's the assassination attempt on Hitler, it's his friends. And he knows that the clock is ticking because they're going to arrest everybody who knew these men. And he wrote to his friend, Frederick Schwend, who ran, I, I forget the name of the operation, but there was the movie made about it, the counterfeiting operation, where they pulled Jews out of the camps to make phony 20-pound uh, notes, British notes, which they were again going to flood the entire European market with to devalue the pound and make it worthless. Well, Schwend wrote to Berlin and said, I need Gisling as my assistant because he knows the American scene, blah, blah, blah. So Gisling gets transferred to northern Murano, Italy, technically as the council, uh, the German council to northern Italy. But within a few weeks, he tells Schwen, I have no 
stomach for this. But what he did have the stomach for is he secretly went into Switzerland with a small number of generals to meet with Alan Dulles, who was then the head of the OSS, the predecessor of the CIA, in Switzerland, in Bern, and they negotiated. He was part of what was called the Operation, the uh, OSS called it Operation Sunrise. He negotiated the surrender of, German, of all German troops in northern Italy, and on May 6, 1945, two days before VE Day, Gisling and the generals led a delegation and they surrendered the entire German forces in northern Italy. Gisling would eventually, um, as I said, he was, he was arrested immediately. Uh, he spent two years in prison. Uh, and my guess, because at one point I wondered, why, why didn't he say anything? Because if anything ever leaked out, the Germans in the prison would have killed him, with no doubt. He retired to Spain where he practiced law until his death. His daughter, after the war, worked for uh, Air, the Air Force Intelligence and wound up marrying a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, an American, and they moved to California where she lived until she died. It's just an amazing story. I mean, as I've been saying, I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Well, a few things. I get asked, that's, that's always the question, one way or another, because it's the question. And sometimes it's asked, well, who is our Leon Lewis of today? And my answer is, look to the left of you and look to the right of you. Any one of you can be the Leon Lewis, but you don't have to run a spy ring. What you have to do is be vigilant. And what I begin to tell people is, what can anyone do? Because it feels overwhelming. What do you do when a president of the United States, and again, this is not Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, but after the march in Charlottesville, where you have white supremacists chanting, the Jews will not replace us, a person is killed, and our president says there are good people on both sides, I am sorry, I am going to be very judgmental here and say there are no good white supremacists. That I don't care if you're nice to your wife or your husband, if you're kind to your children, if you pet your animals on the head. If you are a white supremacist, you are an evil and you are a bad human being, period. And what we need are politicians with the courage, not the cowardice that we see in Congress today. And again, not Democrat or Republican, this is about human rights, the courage to stand up and say no. Purveyors of hate, those who call for death to any group in America, should be pariahs within our country. And the one thing I advise people in America is the one thing every one of you can do is go out and vote. And vote for people who are willing to stand up for democracy and get out of office those who remain silent in the face of hate. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the amazing story. Because I'm wondering why it never got told until now. That's a great question. <laughs> and again, it's one I hear. Why don't we know this story? Um, I would say, because I've been thinking about this, not in a flip way, and I want to say it's part of my generation of historians that we committed a kind of teleological sin. And that is, we know how World War II ended. We know the Nazis were defeated, but the Soviet Union came out triumphant. And therefore, because Germany was defeated, when we look back, we say, oh, well, these Nazis and fascists, they didn't amount to anything in the end. Therefore, we don't really need to study them. What we need to study is communism and anti-communism in America, because that's what mobilized the political scene for decades. And we ignored fascism, and we ignored Nazism until, and I have to say, when I started this book, I never thought it would be a prescient book. I never thought this would speak to the times. I just wanted to 
I had discovered, and the way I discovered this is in the previous book I wrote, Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics, I had been writing a chapter on Edward G. Robinson, who was one of the leaders of the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League that started in 1936. And I wanted to learn more about how did Hollywood mobilize against Nazis. And so I went online to find out more about the Anti-Nazi League. And I found a website that had been set up by the Cal State Northridge Library, the special collection, called in our own backyard, Nazis and Fascists in Los Angeles. And it was a whole description of all these Nazi and fascist groups. And I knew nothing. I'd never, I mean, I'd heard about the Bund. I knew about the Silver Shirts. But I had no idea about all these other groups. And I had no idea that it was so powerful in LA. And so I went to the library. I went in and thought, well, let me see what they've got on the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. They have over 300 boxes of files. And they had several boxes on the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. And I am, in general, a very slow writer. This book was, for me, lightning, six years. My other books are nine to 11 years. And I thought, I can't wait nine to 11 years for this book to come out. Uh, and what would have been maybe a paragraph in a chapter. And I said, when I'm done with Hollywood Left and Right, I'm going to go back to the library and see what the story is. And I have to say, it took me several weeks to figure things out because Leon Lewis, they all knew who Leon Lewis was. And so every day there would be somebody either from the Klan, the Silver Shirts, I don't know, every day, a few days, from the Klan, the Silver Shirts, or the Bund, who would stand outside his office on West 7th Street watching to see if anyone they knew went into the office. Because if anyone they knew went into the office, that would have been one of Leon Lewis's spies. And because Lewis knew they knew this, and how do I know that? Because in the 30s, especially around 38, they started putting his name up. And whenever there'd be a big meeting and a big rally, they would have his name and address. And they would have Mendel Silverberg's name and address up on a big board, inviting, basically inviting people to do violence. Lewis knew that he was going to be under surveillance, and so he organized his files in such a way that if you broke into his office, you couldn't figure out who the spies were or exactly what the operation was. And I was just so puzzled until one of my friends at the library, who's the uh, archivist for the USC Library Special Collections, he said, you know, Joe Roos's papers are here. And I went and I read Joe, and I opened the box, and there was an autobiography that he had written with uh, uh, Len Pitt, who is the historian at Cal State Northridge. And I immediately, it laid out the whole story, and I immediately knew what was going on, and I immediately knew I had a book here, and I had an important book. Was that published autobiography by Ruth? Unpublished. And did any other participants in this drama leave memoirs or interviews? No, as I like to say, this is one of the few times in thousands of years of Jewish history where Jews kept an important secret. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a historian of it Hollywood. No, longer a secret. no, but now it's out there. But I've been working on Hollywood and politics for over 20 years, and I have to tell you, no memoirs mention this. Not a single person who's talked about their experience, not Jack Warner, not Louis B. Mayer, none of the moguls, Harry Cohn, none of them ever mentioned Leon Lewis's spy operation. They kept that secret to their grave. And I interviewed Joe Roos's son, Len Roos, who also knew nothing about what his father had done. And I think part of the reason is they were all afraid. Len told me that his father told him a story only when he became um, an adult, because he didn't want to frighten him as a child. He said one day he was going, walking home, because he didn't drive, and he got jumped by two men who started beating the life out of him. And he told Len, he said, they would have killed me, except the car came along, stopped, and started yelling, what's going on? And the two men ran away. They were afraid that Nazis had promised that if they found out who was responsible, who was spying for Leon Lewis. What they said is, if we find out you're spying for the US government, we will beat you to within an inch of your life, but we will not kill you. But if we find out you are spying for the Jews, you're a dead man. 
And without telling you any of the names, three of Leon Lewis's spies do die under very suspicious circumstances. And I'm convinced at least two of the three were murdered by Nazis. So now this story's out there. Uh, more importantly, the archive is out there. And this archive has several dissertations that can be written from there. Well, I do mention in the books, if you want to stay for another half hour, I'll talk about some of the women. But uh, no, they did not have women uh, as the main spy, but the wives were spying. So for example, John Schmidt, the first recruit, his wife, John Schmidt and his wife uh, began attending, so, Alice Schmidt began attending so many of, they would go there for lunch, they would go there for dinner, they would go to the meetings. And within a few months, Alice Schmidt was named the president of the Women's Friends of New Germany Auxiliary. And she was brought up to the secret offices on the second floor of the Alt Heidelberg. And she was asked to translate secret documents that were coming in from Germany to translate it into English and to translate English documents into German. And they swore her to secrecy, that she could never tell anyone and not even her husband. And of course, everything she found went directly to Leon Lewis. She wrote her own spy reports. Uh, and the other thing is during, right after, well, actually right before Pearl Harbor, he recruited his first mother and daughter spy team. Uh, their father, uh, the husband father, had been a commander also in the Navy and was a good friend of Ellis Zacharias and had constantly told, they had known each other in San Diego, and he was, he told his wife and daughter how horrible he felt because he said, Zacharias is a great man, and he has not been promoted because he's a Jew. And this is a man you can trust for the rest of your life. The husband died. They moved up to uh, Los Angeles, where they were living on a very skimpy income, and they went to Leon Lewis, and they volunteered their services, and in fact, they spied until uh, 1944 when um, Sylvia Comfort, the daughter, was, um, came under suspicion from several of the fascists who were still in the city. Because one of the most surprising findings of my book, and it's something I'm still rumbling about that I want to write about, is when Pearl Harbor came, the myth in America is Pearl Harbor comes, we are bombed by the Japanese, Three days later, we go to war against Japan and Germany after they declare our war on us. And then Americans put aside all their prejudices, unite as one to defeat Nazism and fascism. Well, the only problem is anti-Semitism in Los Angeles went up after Pearl Harbor, and it went up every year until 1945. And Leon Lewis did not trust the police, the sheriff of the FBI to protect Jews because many of the fascists who had belonged to America first. And this is why many of us get chills when we hear our president talking America first. Because America first, you know, their chief spokesperson, Charles Lindbergh, an anti-Semite, receives wards from Nazi Germany and never finds it problematic. They had sworn that if America got into the war, it would be because the Jews got us there. And if we did go to war, we would get rid of the Jews. And one of the first reports that Sylvia Comfort files, three months after Pearl Harbor, she writes Leon Lewis a memo saying, Leon, I just was at a meeting of the Hollywood with Women's Republican Club, and I overheard the following conversation amongst four women. One woman says, you know, there are too many Jewish immigrants in Los Angeles, and they're taking jobs away from good Christians. The second woman says, let's hang them by the lampposts. Third woman says, no, that's going to take too long. And a fourth woman says, well, let's begin sterilizing all of them. There are, in the newspapers, there are announced sermons in L.A., in the newspaper that says, the title of this week's sermon, Shall We Kill the Jew? So these women, these two women became his chief spies during the war. And after the third spy died, 
Uh, Joe Roos said, and Leon Lewis, this is too close. We're not going to take a chance that Sylvia is going to be the fourth. And even though she didn't want to leave, they got her a job in Washington working for a congressperson, and she and her mother left L.A. and moved. Yes? Today we saw in, on one of the newspapers about 100 students from probably Wisconsin University saluting the Hitleristic way. Now that and the synagogues and the universities, the atmosphere in here, anti-Semitic atmosphere in the universities makes me think that or ask if Nazism, Nazism is re-blossoming in the United States? Here's what I would say. Let's not just call it Nazi, let's call it fascism and hate. And what I would say is it's never left. The difference is that when you have a president of the United States who condones this kind of behavior and who doesn't condemn it, it makes it possible for groups to come out and openly proclaim their hatred. It seems to me not coincidental. I don't believe there's more anti-Semitism now than there was necessarily 10 years ago. What I believe is that now the climate is such that these groups can come out from the shadows, come out from the dark basements where they were meeting and meet openly. And I would tell you, I know, first of all, I think the press does exaggerate how much anti-Semitism there is on the campus. Not to say that there isn't, but it makes good stories and stories sell. But to me, the key is, America has been filled with hate since the founding fathers came and eliminated all the Native Americans. We can go through all of history and see so much of America was built on that. But then that hate subsided, and for most of the period, it was not okay to hate other Americans. And it's certainly, if you hate in your head, that's one thing. No one can stop you from being prejudiced. But don't let it come out of your head to your mouth and speak it in public. So again, I don't think it's more than it's been. It's just more open than it's been. Oh, let me get some other. Yes. Steve, I don't know how it uh, seems like you can go on all evening. But, <laughs> all right, the last question what then. You, or, or you, last two questions. Okay, last, you prefer, so. last two. Are we saying the 1930s? Yes. Yes. That time, was, was there yes. In fact, Hermann Schwinn, the head of the Bund there, organized the United Fascists. And if you read histories of communism in America in the 30s, we have written extensively about the Popular Front, which were all liberal and left groups getting together to oppose fascism and Nazism. Well, Hermann Schwinn organized a group of over a dozen different uh, fascist groups and white Russian groups into a fascist organization with the Klan as well. And they were, that's where people like McLaughlin got his volunteers, because they were already meeting on a regular basis there. And were they motivated also against blacks, or were they not? Yes. But here's what I, the Klan in particular, their arch enemy were blacks, and then Jews, and then Catholics. But the one group that they were most uh, the, the, the common denominator were Jews, hatred of Jews. And I know there was a question. Yes, this will be the last question. I'm naive, but I'm always puzzled by the duality of American official position to communism and fascism. And why is it so much more acceptable to be anti-communist than to be anti-fascist? Well, I, I can tell you what I think. It's, it's um, yes, first of all, so many of the communists were Jews. They were right. And that feeds into a long history of anti-Semitism, whereas the fascists were all Christians. They were God-fearing, even though Hitler really believed in a very different kind of God. He wasn't a God-fearing man at all, and he wasn't a Christian. 
Uh, but people believed he was a Christian and be people believed he would protect the churches. The other thing is the communists um, and Jews occupy the most interesting um, and ironic position in American culture. And that is, imagine for years, who controls and to this, who controls the world's media? Who controls the world's banks? Who controls the financial networks of the world? The Jews. Who's trying to destroy the financial networks? Who's trying to destroy, you know, the media? The Jews, the communists. So Jews are both responsible for controlling capitalism in the most vicious way and for trying to destroy capitalism. So you can hate Jews for everything. <laughs> and again, I do believe Nazis and fascists are Christians. And we live in America, we live in a Christian country. Anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>